As discussed previously, there are basically two kinds of X-Files episodes, arc stories and monsters of the week. Obviously, by definition, the former are connected, while the latter are almost always standalone stories. Well, Toombs is a rare exception, revisiting the character of stretchy monster thing Eugene Toombs to give him what the writers felt would be a better chance to let him show his stuff than in Squeeze. They had set up the possibility, although it was more like a little thing to make you squirm with the thought that he might escape his cell and continue to wreak his liver-stealing havoc upon the world. With that little dinner tray hatch? So naturally that's where we've got to start, with Toombs trying to use it to escape his cell. But before he can reach his handle, Dr. Monty arrives to offer him a choice of doors with cars and goats behind them, and also to assure him that there's a very good chance that he'll be deemed fit to re-enter society tomorrow. That's our tombs, huh? Tries to stage an escape the day before his hearing to be released legitimately, because of that urgent time schedule called, I'm Bored. After the, the truth is out there, we are introduced to a new character, Mulder and Scully's boss, Walter Skinner, in his only season one appearance. He's naturally wondering what the hell when it comes to what they're dealing with. Unusable evidence, a lack of proper procedures, that kind of thing. He tells her to start doing things properly. The usual job of the big guy with the desk, you know, do it by the book. It's that and turn in your badge. The whole time Cancer Man watches and smokes. It's an important job and he does it well. Meanwhile, the case for releasing Tombs is going well. Everyone's saying that his attack on Scully, the only thing that they could actually prove that he did, was just a psychological breakdown that he has since recovered from. The state's going to need some pretty convincing arguments to rebut that. These elongated fingerprints found at seven of the 19 crime scenes match Eugene Victor Toombs. Agent Mulder, look at his fingers. Look at him. A hundred years old. I contend old. that perhaps through a genetic mutation, Eugene Toombs is capable of contorting and elongating his body in order to gain access to victims so that he may extract the livers which provide him sustenance for the hibernation period of 30 years. Mulder, you're going to wind up in Toombs' padded room if you don't stop talking. One of Mulder's biggest personal problems is that he's like many fanatics. He's so convinced that he's right, and yes, we do know that he is in this case, but he approaches it in a matter-of-fact way instead of trying to convince people. Although in this case, I've got to know what the hell the state attorney was thinking, letting Mulder ramble on about this stuff rather than working with him ahead of time to get his testimony to, well, at least sound plausible. Mulder, your testimony, you sounded so... I don't care how it sounded, as long as it was the truth. Right, let a mutant serial killer walk the streets rather than trying to sound convincing. That's taking the long view. I know he's mentioned his impatience with people he feels are closed-minded, but when it's a hearing about letting a dangerous maniac out onto the streets, it's time to put the passive-aggressive thing on hold and sort it the hell out. I'm not saying Mulder should have lied, but as someone whose job it is, in the end, to protect the public, he should have been convincing them that Toombs needs to stay where he is. He needs to present his testimony in a way to maximize those chances and put his personal crusade on the back burner. And where were you? You know, it's your job to stop me when I do crazy things. Your testimony was important. I was called into a meeting. What? So the standard by-the-book procedure that Skinner was talking about is to interfere with someone testifying in court? What good's all the proper detective work in the world mean if you can't corroborate it? Anyway, Toombs is released on the condition that he continues therapy, that he keeps his job, and that he stays with this couple for the time being. He needs to kill. He'll do it the first chance he can, but he won't kill the old couple. He won't be that obvious. So Mulder will be on stakeout duty while Scully is in charge of solving one of the previous murders from decades ago to try to get him arrested for that. But there's a ticking clock. Old couple, I'm only 54 for Christ's sakes. So Toombs is back on the streets, picking up dead rats. Oh, I guess I understated it. It's not just finger licking. He's practically performing cunnilingus on his fingers. He starts stalking another victim, but Mulder gets in the way, so he settles on a businessman in an ugly coat, stalking him back to his home. But he forgets. Fox Mulder is the one who's on the case. <laughs> because an alien! Somehow, Toombs managed to evade the keen detective instincts of Mulder, so he tries to enter through the toilet, but alas, he's undone. Curse you, Fisher Price! Well, it would have been nice to do things the easy way, wriggle through the sewage, up the pipe, and squeeze out of a toilet, but with that way removed, Toombs is going to have to resort to the far more difficult challenge of coming through the window. Luckily, Mulder arrives and Toombs takes off, still short on livers. Boy, if this doesn't let up, Toombs may get desperate. He'll... He'll have to move from coming in people's windows to just buying a liver at the grocery store. 
Meanwhile, Scully's investigation leads her back to the retired Lieutenant Briggs and his box full of old tombs evidence. You know, things to keep busy with in your spare time and your retirement, like this organ in a jar. He suspects that Tombs might have ditched a body in the foundation of this old building because it somehow tied him to the victim. It's just a hunch, though, something that goes against Skinner's orders to do things by the book. But they try it, and sure enough, there's a body there, and... Oh, God, no, it's Frodo! But why would Tombs kill Frodo? Why would a gangly creature with an abnormally long life and a penchant for eating raw flesh want to kill... <gasps> Smeagol, no! The process of extracting the information, not to mention the body, is long and slow, but the forensic scientist gives an unofficial confirmation that this guy is the guy that Briggs thought could be the victim. At this point, it's hard not to wonder if Briggs put the guy there all those years ago. He did insist on the exact spot to dig up the body, and had a photo of the guy that he thought was the victim. It's only the spookiness of the X-Files world, where both ghosts and aliens run about, that you can say, psychic connection to the case, or something. Scully takes over the stakeout for Mulder. He can't get further back up without running the risk of being told that even he can't watch Tombs, and he's been running it for so long he's going to get sloppy and might accidentally shoot a man thinking he's a paranormal monster, like a Yeti or John Edwards. So Scully takes over, and only for us to find out that Tombs has actually been hiding in his trunk. This, incidentally, now leads to definitive proof that Toombs is culpable for his actions. Even if you wanted to argue that his previous kills were all somehow instinctive and he didn't know right from wrong, here he sneaks into Mulder's apartment and deliberately begins to frame him for attacking Toombs. In fact, the only thing that proves that Mulder didn't is a relatively obscure piece of forensic knowledge, that examination of his injuries, like Mulder's shoe print, could show that whether or not there was a foot in the shoe at the time when it caused the impact, and that would prove that he didn't do it. Well, that's intelligent behavior, which makes Toombs responsible for the evil that he has done. Anyway, it doesn't matter, because Scully claims that while Toombs was allegedly beaten, she was with Mulder, so he couldn't have done it. Not that Skinner buys a word of that. What helps Skinner work is that he starts out gray. Yes, he's chewing out Scully for not going by the book, which seems to make him just another pencil-pushing desk jockey. But when he speaks with Mulder one-on-one... -on -one, his performance is a mixture of both the seriousness his position requires with the humanity to treat Mulder as a person rather than a file folder, talking of his potential and not trying to talk him out of the X-Files, just telling him to step away for a moment and get his head on straight. Skinner may not be aligned with Mulder, but that doesn't mean he's an adversary or unreasonable. So when it's clear that Mulder won't heed his advice, he's got to order him to stay away from tombs, just as much to protect what he assumes to, to be an ordinary, if possibly guilty, guy from a good agent who might make a mistake that ends a promising career and ruins or ends someone's life. Speaking of ending a life, Dr. Monty shows up at tombs' place to check up on him. And sometimes when you're really jonesing for a liver, you just can't wait to stalk somebody, so tombs takes his. During this, Scully has matched up Tomb's dental records with teeth marks on the concrete skeleton. That gives them probable cause, but they find out that he's killed again and gone back to his old nest. Only now it's a mall. Huh. I wonder what would have happened if they'd have torn the place down while Tombs was nesting in there. If he'd have died, or if he'd have had the wherewithal to wake up and deal with them. We'll never know, because now he's living the high life. No more brick and asbestos basements for Toomsy here. No, he's living under an escalator. Wow. Some mutants save their whole lives and can't even afford a nook on a subway. But Toombs has really made something of himself. No sweet lips are chewing him, baby. Ain't nothing wrong with that. So Mulder crawls inside after him. Boy, Mulder, I'm not sure you're getting that out of your shirt. And he finds Toombs' nest, where there's a brief struggle and... Yep, kiss that shirt goodbye, Mulder. There's no ancient Chinese seeker that takes out grease and mutant bile. Scully manages to pull Mulder out in time for him to switch on the escalator, and that's it for Tombs. Well, we're moving on now, moving on to the east side, on to a deluxe apartment in the sky. Besides the first appearance of Skinner, Tombs features another first. After almost a whole season, Cancer Man finally says something. Do you believe them? Of course I do. That was so worth the wait. As a monster sequel, I'm going to give this a stamp of strongly recommended, but only if you see Squeeze first. Its closure to the story of Tombs is worth it, even if it's not quite as strong as the first part was. The secondary plot to this is Scully having to continue to walk a tightrope between her superior's demands and her loyalty to Mulder. 
her having to continuously go against policy throughout the episode, despite Skinner's orders not to, shows that she's chosen her side. But she's unwilling to burn her bridges like Mulder seems to have either. Toombs was only three episodes from the end of the season, and it ends with Mulder reflecting on a chrysalis and commenting, No, a change for us is coming. How do you know? A hunch. We'll see what he's referring to when we get to our next X-Files review, The Erlenmeyer Flask, which closes out Season 1. Could you help me find my dog? He's a Norwegian elk hound. His name is Heinrich. I use him to hunt moose. <laughs> 